All right, well, <clears throat> this evening, um, as I've already mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to be looking at what happens when the 70 who were sent out, as we saw this morning, uh, now return. So let's uh, read that in verses, uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through verse uh, 24. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wish to see the things which you see, and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear, and did not hear them. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. All right, so this morning, uh, again, we saw the Lord send out the 70. Uh, the church was, was growing. Uh, more of the disciples were maturing. Uh, there were more workers uh, for the harvest, and so Jesus sends them out. Uh, we saw to uh, winnow out the cities that would reject him. Um, remember what well, we, we, we saw, well, we'll see in just a moment, again, be reminded of how they were to respond, but I think we should assume that Jesus wasn't going to go to those cities after they had dusted you know, the, the dirt off of their feet. But he sent them out there to winnow out those cities that would reject him and to break ground in those that would receive him. Again, let's remember that it's a process, isn't it? Uh, in, in the Lord reaching out to someone through us to bring them to faith, there is a process involved, breaking ground, planting seed, watering seed. We don't know where we are in the process but we do need to be a part of that process if we want to see the lost come to faith in Christ. And, of course, that's what we want to see because that's what the Lord desires. We saw, second, uh, that they were to offer or extend, uh, basically, the offer of the Lord's peace, peace through the Lord Jesus, peace through the gospel. Jesus said that as they preached the gospel, they were to say, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Uh, preaching the gospel or sharing the gospel actually brings the kingdom of God near to those who are far from the gospel because it brings them near to the king who offers himself to them through this message. And again, that's the importance of sharing the gospel with someone is that's how Jesus draws near to them. So we need to share that word. But third, we saw the consequences for rejecting his offer. Remember how Jesus said judgment would be severer for them, for those that were offered the gospel, where the kingdom of heaven came near, but yet they rejected it, it would be severer for them than for the very wicked cities of Sodom and Tyre and Sidon. Again, remembering that the, the greater the, uh, the offer, the greater the light, the greater the privilege that's extended uh, to people, the greater the accountability. Okay, more light, more responsibility. Now, this evening, we, again, see uh, two things. We see the disciples' joy when they returned because uh, of the things the Lord had done through them, the power that they were able to exercise over the kingdom of darkness. But second, we see Jesus pointing out to them an even greater blessing, which he didn't want them to overlook, and that is that their names are written in heaven. I think the most interesting thing that we may be looking at this evening is the fact that there really isn't a connection between the authority they were exercising and the fact that their names are written in heaven because, um, well, we'll see in a minute why that is the case. Okay, first of all, we see the disciples' joy in verse 17. 
The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. When they went out to the cities and the towns to preach, remember what Jesus told them that they needed to do. He told them, first of all, well, preach the gospel, of course. We've already looked at that. But also to heal those whom they found that, that were sick. Uh, one thing about the miracles that Jesus did is that they benefited people. Okay, for the most part, all of his miracles did, except maybe for the cursing of the fig tree. But he was raising the dead, healing the lepers, you know, causing the paralytics to walk. He wanted his disciples to serve the people they went to, to relieve his covenant people of their burdens. Remember the woman who was bent over for so many years, what a burden that was. God wanted to show them mercy, okay? Now, to be able to serve even in that way would have been, I think, a very exciting thing. I mean, just imagine, put yourself in their place if, if the Lord had given you such authority to lay hands on someone who had been suffering for years who couldn't be helped by the doctors, and to see them recover immediately and to see the joy that that would bring to them and, of course, to those who cared about them and the honor that would bring to the Lord. That would be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it? Uh, but Jesus also gave them the authority to deliver those who were afflicted with demons. And I think, uh, as we understand what demons did to people, that would be a far worse affliction and a much greater mercy to relieve them of it. Okay, how much more of a blessing would that be? When the devil enters a person, we, we saw the example of, of how he abused the little boy. Remember how the father came to Jesus after he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration? Lord, have mercy on my son. This um, son who was demon-possessed, we read that the demon would, would slam the boy to the ground. He would throw him into the fire and into the water, trying to destroy him. But Jesus had given them authority to cast out those demons and to be able to do so, how thrilling it would be to be used in that way to show that kind of mercy and to glorify God. I think, you know, that we really may not be able to experience anything exactly like that today, but actually as we think about the greater blessing that Jesus is going to talk about, we can have that kind of joy and perhaps an even greater joy when we know that we have been used by the Lord to lead a person out of the devil's kingdom and into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel. I don't think there's any greater blessing on earth than being used by the Lord to do that. We can't save anyone. Only Jesus can, right? But if he uses us as he did these disciples, that would be a tremendous honor and privilege and would give to us great joy. Well, the disciples came back rejoicing over all that the Lord had done through them. And after they told Jesus uh, about their trips and their excitement, he said to them this in verses 18 and 19. I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. You know, I think... Um, the, the one thing here that may not be entirely clear, and as you read different commentaries, I think that is the case, and that is what did Jesus mean by the fact that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven? Really, he could mean one of two different things. He could be referring to the time of the fall of Satan when he was Lucifer in heaven, when he led the rebellion against God, trying to exalt his throne above God's. Shortly after the creation week, uh, when, as, of course, the eternal Son of God in heaven, Jesus witnessed these very things as well as his being cast out of heaven to the earth. By the way, we recognize that that being cast down uh, was not perhaps absolute because we do see Satan appearing uh, with the sons of God, as it were, before God to tempt Job. So we know he still had some type of access to heaven, but we do know that he fell from his height down to the very depths. He was the greatest, perhaps, of the Lord's creation, right? The greatest uh, angel the Lord had made. He was the anointed cherub, uh, the one that uh, had every precious stone for his covering and had the sum of all wisdom. And yet, because of his pride, we read in Ezekiel 28, verse 16, this, 
the Lord speaking to Satan, Therefore I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Now we know that Jesus, as the Son of God, saw this take place. And he also knew that because of that fall, that Satan's time was coming, and now he was seeing it happen as the kingdom of God was growing, um, Satan's kingdom would have to retreat. Or he could be referring essentially to that work itself, that through the work of the disciples and what they had just done in their ministry, that this is what he was referring to as seeing Satan fall. Because here is the beginning of the enemy's overthrow as the kingdom of heaven begins to move forward with greater power. You know, the Bible says that that kingdom that our Lord Jesus Christ has brought, the one that his disciples were preaching, uh, is one day going to fill the entire earth. And as it does, it's going to supplant or replace Satan's dominion. Remember how the world was handed over to Satan when Adam succumbed to his temptation and fell. Uh, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world. He's the one that presented to Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth. And Jesus didn't challenge his ability to do that. He is the god of this world. But that position is being supplanted by our Lord's kingdom. I believe that that's what the Lord was, was showing to Nebuchadnezzar in that dream that he had about the statue and the statue's destruction. Daniel, uh, remember how Nebuchadnezzar wanted his wise men to tell him the dream, and nobody could but Daniel. But this is what Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2, verses 34 through 35. You, that is king, continued looking at this statue until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, if we were able to get into this whole uh, dream, this whole vision, and, and uh, look at it more carefully, we, we would see several things, but this is what I want us to see. The different metals, as you know, represented different kingdoms, kingdoms that were under the dominion of the devil. The stone is the kingdom that Jesus was bringing, the kingdom that would put an end to all these other kingdoms or to Satan's dominion, and it would continue to grow until it filled the whole earth. Now, how do we know that's what the uh, stone actually refers to? Because of what um, Daniel says in verse 44, that same chapter, in the days of those kings, the kings represented by the different metals, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Actually, it's the, the clay and the, the toes mixed, which I believe is referring to the Roman Empire, by the way. Uh, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. So the point is essentially this, that it appears to be the case that what Jesus was referring to was the fall of Satan because of the advancing of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, that he's seeing Satan fall, as it were, as the God of this world, as the kingdom of heaven begins to move forward. Now remember, this is really talking about the Great Commission, isn't it? Because that work of extending the kingdom and overthrowing Satan's kingdom is still going about. Jesus advances his kingdom. He's causing the stone, which is, you know, this, this one's going to grow into a great mountain that fills the whole earth. He's causing it to grow through the members of his kingdom, through us, through all of his people, until the whole earth is filled with the knowledge of the Lord. So basically, we're engaged in a warfare that is not dissimilar to that of the disciples. And our Lord has also given us authority as ambassadors to move this warfare forward. This warfare that we're engaged in is against the kingdom of darkness. But one thing we do need to remember is that uh, even as it was with the disciples, so it is with us. This is spiritual warfare, right? We're not fighting against mankind, okay? 
Um, though sometimes it may seem like that's where the battle lies. You know, as we look at the people who are involved in it, we think they're the enemies, but they're not the enemies. The enemies are, are actually the ones behind them. We're actually fighting for them, not against them. We're fighting for their souls. Our goal is to free them from the enemy's tyranny. Let's remember what Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The fact that it isn't against the people necessarily, I think is brought out by what Jesus says on the cross when he prays for those who are crucifying him. He didn't look at them as his enemies, but he prayed for them that his father might have mercy on them. So it's those who are behind them that this warfare is, is against. And that's why our weapons are not physical weapons, but spiritual weapons. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh or of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I mean, essentially the weapons, the weapons of our warfare, Paul talks about them in Ephesians 6, both the offensive and defensive weapons, are essentially God's truth, the Bible, uh, the gospel, and of course, prayer. And those are the weapons we need to be using if we are to basically uh, assault the, uh, the fortresses of the enemy. So if we are to win this battle, as the disciples did, okay, we must use these weapons. And we need to have confidence that the Lord will actually use these things to free people from, again, the enemy's camp. Now, this victory was something to rejoice in, okay? They were rejoicing, but Jesus tells them, secondly, that they had something that was even better than this. He continues in verse 20 uh, of Luke 10. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Now, it kinda, that's an interesting statement. First of all, we need to understand that Jesus is not telling them or forbidding them to rejoice at all in, in what he had accomplished through them. I, you know, because they should rejoice in that, right? To be used like that would be a tremendous blessing, but I think what he's saying is in comparison to this greater blessing. You know, don't, don't you know, so much rejoice in that, but rejoice in this, in the far greater blessing of eternal life, okay? That their names were recorded in the book of life. Now, I think we'd all agree that that would be better, wouldn't it? Better than casting out demons, to know that your name is written in heaven, to know that you're saved, to know that you are safe from an eternity of suffering, that you are looking forward to basically enjoying the blessing of fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with all the saints and the angels forever. I think that would top anything that the disciples had experienced up to that point. And I think uh, certainly we would agree with that. But um, we might ask this question, doesn't the one imply the other? The fact that they were given this authority and they exercised authority successfully over the power of the enemy. Doesn't that imply that they're already, their names are already written in the, in the uh, basically in heaven? Well, you know, the, the answer to that question is not necessarily. Okay, not necessarily. When Jesus sent out the 12 with authority to heal the sick and to raise the dead, to cleanse the lepers, to cast out demons... Matthew 10, verse 8. We do need to remember that there was one among them who did these things whose name was not written in heaven, and that is, of course, Judas. Jesus said about him in John 6, verses 70 through 71, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. I think sometimes we don't understand in the Bible that, you know, certain abilities and gifts didn't necessarily go hand in hand with salvation. 
Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that it's actually possible to, to have and to exercise many of the spiritual gifts and still not be saved, okay? To speak in tongues, to prophesy, to know mysteries, to have the gift of knowledge, and to have faith to move mountains. Paul says you can do all these things, but if you don't have love, it won't profit you anything. Love is greater than all of these things because the kind of love that God gives is going to continue when all these other things will fade away. This kind of love actually demonstrates that we are saved, but the gifts don't demonstrate that because one might have them and one might actually be able to use them, at least in apostolic times, and not have this love, not be saved. I think the disciples' salvation was a separate issue uh, from the fact that they had this ability, something else that they could rejoice in and something else that they should rejoice in. That's exactly what Jesus did. He rejoiced when, when he... Uh, and by the way, just think about this for a minute. Think about what this would do to bolster your assurance. Don't rejoice that you had authority over these demons, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Some people actually struggle. A lot of people struggle. Perhaps you struggle. Perhaps you still do, do struggle over whether or not you really know the Lord, especially when you read in the Bible what it is the Spirit of God does in, in our hearts and what our lives should be you know, moving towards, sometimes we might struggle whether or not we actually belong to Him. But here our Lord tells them that they're saved, okay? Your names are written in heaven. That's wonderful, isn't it? It dispels all the doubts, at least for the moment. Uh, our flesh can come in after that and cause difficulties. But He says you should rejoice in this. And Jesus basically rejoiced in it Himself, didn't He? Because we read in verse 21, at that time, at that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things, the things having to do with salvation, from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. The, the 70 here, the people he's referring to, yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Jesus was rejoicing that the Father in His wisdom had hidden this from the intellectuals. You know how Paul says on one occasion that man through his wisdom was not able to find God. Philosophy cannot connect you with God. It, it can show you that God exists, but it can't bring you into a relationship with God. Uh, God has hidden this from the wise and intelligent, but He had revealed it to babes. He revealed it to these. Now, Jesus also rejoiced that His Father had given Him the honor of being the one who would reveal the Father to them. Okay, so he's rejoicing. First of all, the Father has revealed these things. He's revealed Jesus to them. And so that they've come to him. They've seen the kingdom in him. They've seen his glory and his beauty, and they have trusted him. But now he's rejoicing that the Father has given the Son the honor to reveal the Father to them. He continues in verse 22. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes it's hard to make a distinction between the two because the reason Jesus came into the world was to show us the Father. Remember, He came to explain Him to us. When Thomas asked Jesus, show us the Father, and that'll be enough, Jesus said to him in John 14, verse 9, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. By the way, let's not get lost in the oneness, you know, heresy here. Jesus is not saying, I am the Father, but he's come to reveal the Father to us, to show us what he's like. And the reason he can do that is because he and the Father are basically of the same character. So he has come to reveal the Father, to reveal his love and his mercy and these disciples are blessed because that's what Jesus is doing for them. They were blessed that they knew the Son, and they were blessed that they knew the Father, which is really what eternal life is all about. As I mentioned before, eternal life is not just, you know, endless life, and it's not just a condition of happiness, you know, as opposed to suffering, although it, it contains those things. But eternal life is relationship, isn't it? 
Jesus said in his high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So they were blessed. Their names are written in heaven, and they were in a relationship with the Father and the Son. They knew them, not just about them, but were in relationship with them. You know, Christianity is not just a belief system. You know, there is what we call the faith, which is what we are to believe, and we need to know what that is. But uh, faith or, you know, eternal life, Christianity is relationship with the Lord, actually knowing Him in the sense of having a relationship with Him versus just knowing about Him. So we need to be careful that we don't spend all of our time just learning about Him and not really spending time with Him. Uh, when we have a worship service, we're actually doing both, aren't we? We're communing with Him, we're worshiping Him, we're adoring Him, we're thanking Him, we're praising Him, and we're learning about Him. Uh, so it's not just the learning about Him. It's not just a sermon. That's not what we're here for. It's just a sermon. We're here to love Him and to develop that relationship with Him and to learn more about Him so that we might draw nearer to Him. And then Jesus says one more thing, that they were blessed to see uh, what many prophets and kings wanted to see, but didn't in, in Luke 10, verses 23 through 24. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see, for I say to you that many prophets and kings wish to see the things which you see and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? Well, you know, the prophets and the kings they, in a certain sense, saw Jesus, okay? They saw him through the eyes of faith. They saw him through the types and shadows. They saw him through the promises, and they believed in him, and they were saved, at least the ones that were saved, right? But they didn't see the fulfillment of these things the way that the disciples were seeing them, right? The way that we have recorded in the pages of Scripture where we can read it and we can also see it in that way. They didn't know exactly how that was going to be fulfilled, we have passages in Scripture that indicate the prophets themselves, after they wrote down their prophecies, would study what they wrote, trying to understand what it is that it meant regarding the Christ. Well, they still saw Him, even though it was far off, and they were saved by Him, but they didn't see the things the disciples saw. Jesus said they were blessed to be able to see that. And the fact is, we are blessed as well because we have by His grace, seen it. We have witnesses who record it for us. We can read about it, and we have the Spirit of God testifying to us that this actually is the truth. And so, to sum up, we may not necessarily be able to cast out demons. Some people believe they can. Perhaps the Lord uh, will, you know, uh, allow us to do that someday, although I'm not necessarily saying that that's something we would hope to do. We can't raise the dead, Okay. Heal the sick. We can't do that. We can't speak in tongues. We can't prophesy. We may not know all mysteries and have all knowledge. And we may not even have the faith to move mountains. Perhaps our faith is not even as great as a mustard seed. But if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we do have something that is better than all of that. Okay? Our names are written in the book of life. We are in a relationship with the Father and the Son. Uh, we have seen things that prophets and kings wanted to see but did not see. And because of God's mercy towards us, having seen those things and having trusted in Jesus, we will spend eternity with the Father and the Son in a world basically of perfect love and peace, developing that relationship. You know, one of the things that uh, we looked at this morning is there are degrees of punishment in hell. Um, we didn't get into detail about that, but I also mentioned there's degrees of, of pleasure in heaven, uh, degrees of reward. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, I'll refer to him again because this is his idea. He, he didn't talk so much about the degrees of punishment in hell, though he did, he did mention that he agreed with Joseph Bellamy when he wrote about the fact that when, when, we're, when, when, this, when the wicked are judged by the Lord and they're placed at a certain level in hell, that they continue to descend in the lake of fire, that their judgment increases 
for all eternity. We'll, we'll get into that perhaps a little bit later as we go through the Gospel of Luke. But Edwards said this, that as we're in heaven and we begin at that particular level according to the rewards the, of His grace that He gives us for our service to Him here, that our blessedness will continue to increase throughout all eternity because in our relationship, in our fellowship with the Father and the Son, we're going to be learning more and more about them and seeing more and more of their glory. And because they're infinite, because they're an infinite being, uh, there's no end to how much we'll see and how much we'll learn, which means that throughout eternity, our blessedness will continue to increase and we'll never reach the end of it. That's what we have, you see. That's what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's much more blessed to have our names written in heaven than to have all the greatest charismatic gifts or any kind of gifts in the world, even to possess the riches of the world. It's greater to know Jesus and to know that we are safe in Him. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard.